Uh, good morning, especially to our YouTube audience for the Karen Chapel service on Mother's Day, May 9th, 2021. I'm excited to be with you. My name is Reverend Jack Abel. I'm the Senior Director of Spiritual Care at Karen here on Magic Mountain and the Principal Presider of the Chapel Service. And I have a live uh, audience here with me today of patients who are currently in our treatment who um, we are not able to include on camera because of HIPAA protections. And I understand we may have a little trouble with our live stream audience, but we may have other patients watching on campus um, as well. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome you. And uh, being Mother's Day, I made a mention of it in the announcements, and I'm going to uh, mention it also in the message. But I want to start today with a little bit of a touch on something I did not learn about a great deal early in my recovery. Um, so I'm not sure it's essential to know the early history of the recovery movement called Alcoholics Anonymous, but I want to bring a couple of stories from the early foundings of AA to bear on the theme for today, which is love and longing. And so um, Alcoholics Anonymous starts in 1935 to 1939. In 1939, its first book is published. And there are events that happen in the 1920s and 1930s that lead to the encounter between two gentlemen, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith, in Akron in 1935 that create Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, a lot of people have spent a lot of time studying it as a historical event, and there's been a good deal of scholarship uh, to try and go back and sort of piece together elements of the puzzle, and there's... Um, kind of AA shrines that you can visit. It's, it's, a, um, it's a whole thing. And uh, so one of the pieces I want to talk about is the role of a person whose name you probably have heard, Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, who was one of the principal founders of contemporary mental health care. So Dr. Carl Jung was a younger human being than Sigmund Freud, but Freud and Jung did live uh, uh, as contemporaries and they had debates and dialogues with one another, and Freud and Jung together have shaped a huge amount of psychology and psychiatry in the 20th and 21st centuries. They were uh, tremendously important as founders of almost any medical or scientific movement. Isaac Newton and Leibniz and the calculus, or Copernicus and da Vinci, you know, the, these kinds of names. Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud, tremendously important. And, uh, you know, we make jokes about Freud being weird and Freudian things, and Freud was weird. They were both weird, by the way. Jung and Freud were both very, very odd characters. But they've given us a legacy of mental health care that's tremendously important. And it turns out that there is a point of intersection where Carl Jung influences the birth of AA. And I just want to tell you a little bit about that. So Carl Jung uh, in Switzerland had a patient whose first name was Roland, We'll pretend HIPAA matters, but his name is well known, his last name is well known, and he never actually becomes a member of AA. But Roland suffered from our affliction. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and Roland, too, was a person who, uh, I think, as alcoholism becomes the way this becomes referred to in the 20th century, Roland was an alcoholic. And, uh, but he came from a large and influential family, and he was a big business person in his own journey, and so he was capable of seeking treatment Overseas, and he went to Switzerland to see Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. It turns out in 1926 and again in 1931. So when Roland was going to this famous new psychoanalyst to try and get well from his addictive disorders, um, it, it was not terribly successful. And um, Roland loved Dr. Young and thought it was going to work and this was going to be the answer and I'm going to get better. And then he left treatment in 1926 and quickly found himself drinking again. And then he went back in 31 and he's like, what's the deal? You're supposed to be the top of the game. And, um, you know, and, and according to Roland, as the story trickles its way to Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, Roland has an encounter with Dr. Young in which Dr. Young says, it appears, Roland, that you are sicker than my methods will help. Psychiatry is not the answer for you. And Roland was heartbroken. He was like, what do you mean? Am I like hopeless? And instead, Dr. Young said, well, I will tell you, um, there are certain times when I have heard people who suffer with their problem with alcohol like you have who have gotten well, but it's very infrequent 
and it's not easy to tell you exactly where to go or what to do to get well. But what happens is that every once in a while, I've heard about people who have these bizarre spiritual transformations. They all of a sudden have this complete change of being and state of being, and it has a spiritual quality to it. And I don't mean by that just going and belonging to a church or something. It's more deep than that. It's a more profound conversion experience. But you might want to hang around those kinds of places and see if you get, you know, zapped. So Roland, in fact, comes back to the United States. He's an American, and he attaches himself to a movement in the 1920s there's still a legacy of it in the world today under a different name. But in the 1920s, there was a movement called the Oxford Group Movement, which was a Christian evangelical renewal movement. One of its hopes was to take people who struggle with alcohol and help them get their lives back together, but it also was people who were recidivistic with crime or couldn't hold their marriages together or various sorts of other kind of human challenges. Sorry, this mask is driving me nuts. I should have worn something different. Anyway, Roland comes back, he becomes a part of an Oxford group, and indeed, in some way, phew, he, like, he finds himself capable of abstaining from alcohol, and he attributes it to uh, this spiritual transformation and this movement, which is tremendously important in those 12 steps. The Oxford groups were used as an inspiration by Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob to write the 12 steps. And things like prayer, meditation, sacrifice, service, inventory, all were part of the Oxford group movement as they become part of the AA movement. So if you want to get more into the history, I know I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do a whole AA history thing, but I want to get to this second piece of the Dr. Young story. So Dr. Young's patient, Roland, becomes a part of the Oxford group movement in the 1920s and ends up telling his story to a friend of Bill Wilson, and that's how Bill Wilson hears about Dr. Young, is that Ebby, Bill's friend, gets sober. Ebby ends up having been a patient at Karen, by the way, so much for HIPAA. But, um, uh, uh, so these, uh, these connections are bizarre, and many people talk about it as a, um, a series of things where seconds and inches have kept AA successful. If this chance encounter had not happened, and that chance encounter had not happened, then maybe we wouldn't all be here today and be able to celebrate and find a way out of our illness. Which is kind of an interesting reflection, although I suspect that would be true of any movement if you look back at it historically. So, stay on track, Jack. Bill Wilson learns about this story of his patient. And Bill Wilson, too, has a zapped experience. He had struggled to get sober, had tried to like um, get, get sober. He had a doctor, a guy named Dr. Silkworth, who told him very similarly, dude, I might not be able to help you. And you may just end up in the sanitarium or dead or whatever. And instead, Bill has heard from his friend, Ebby, about Dr. Young's allegation. And Bill experiences this like, wow, I'm having a spiritual transformation experience. And in fact, Bill says he was pretty sure he would never drink again. And this is all in the 1930s. In 1961, that's a long time later, in the last year of Dr. Young's life, he's 86 years old, AA has become a thing. There are 300,000 members in AA, approximately. There are meetings, there are like 8,000 meetings around the world. The book has been into its second or third edition. It's been published in multiple languages. There's already N.A. and Al-Anon, and there's um, probably several other variants that are emerging and recovery. And all of a sudden, the world has an actual solution to the problem of addiction that large numbers of people can access, which was not true in the 1920s. But in 1961, there is this movement, which has its imprint on this place, on Magic Mountain. And Bill Wilson, 10 years before his death, doc decides to write Dr. Young, the famous psychoanalyst, a letter, which is part of AA's history. I have a copy of the two letters I'm about to refer to right next to me. Bill Wilson writes in early January in 1961, Dear Dr. Young, and he writes this long letter, it's like a three-page thing. I need to tell you this whole story about how AA just loves you because you helped start our movement. And you probably don't know this story, but you had a patient named Roland way back when. His buddy, Eddie, told me, and you're so wonderful, and um, 
You told him to seek a spiritual experience, and we are all about sharing spiritual experience. So that's how Bill Wilson pitches AA in this letter, is he says, we do this um, chain, is the word he uses. It's a chain transmission where I share my woo experience with you, and you share it with you, and you share it with you, and it's almost like any other spiritual movement. It's this transmission of this extraordinary piece of good news that helps like awaken somebody out of a dark path and into a path of healing and wholeness. And so I think the Bill Wilson letter was written on January 10th and sent to Switzerland. On January 30th, Dr. Jung writes him back. And uh, this is a actual photograph of the letter. Uh, done on a typewriter. Fascinating letter. Dr. Young says, he quotes a Jewish psalm, one of the Hebrew writings, and he talks about the longing that human beings have for God. In this psalm, Psalm 42, the ancient Hebrew writer says, as the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. Oh God. Longing. And another thing that Dr. Young says in the letter, besides, hey, thanks, this is cool, it's interesting to learn. And shortly later that year, Dr. Young will die in June of that year. Another thing Dr. Young says is, isn't it interesting that the word alcohol in Latin is spiritus? So Dr. Young says it is as if the longing that Roland has and every human being has for the most high and noble and beautiful thing that we long for becomes misattached to this longing for this terrible, awful thing that essentially just takes and takes and gives nothing back. Those are my words, not Dr. Young. But I do think that that's what it is. And I think if you think about Addiction as a longing, it's a longing illness. I have a feeling I, I, when I say that you all have felt it. In the early part of the 20th century, as heroin becomes in view, right? Have you ever heard people saying Jonesing? It comes from the use of the term Jones as a secret code. Like when you would move to a new town, you'd say, hey, you know where I can find Mr. Jones? But what I think is interesting is that it makes a relationship out of the, it makes it, it's like, it's like heroin's a person. Alcohols are Jose Cuervo and Johnny Walker. If you talk to spouses of people who have addiction issues, you'll find them saying that their spouse being in an addiction feels like the betrayal, like an affair. So, very tragically, you are at Karen because of ungovernable longing. And you're a chapel, and we want to help you find a replacement for longing. Those of us who suffer from this illness are craving. We talk about cravings, right? It is deep longing. And it's a longing that will make a mother yearn for the addiction rather than for her baby. It'll make a husband, and I don't mean to just use family stereotypes that are so monolithic, but I mean it'll make a family member yearn like Miss Benson, totally blow it completely in this awful, awful way. It is so tragic and painful, this illness. And, and it, not only does it hurt the people right immediately around us, but it's awful if, when you wake up and you realize, oh my God, I missed my kid's graduation, or I missed this thing. So the shame of it is, is tremendously horrible. And in the 20th century, I was so surprised when I did the research for today, 1990 was the principal like stamping of a movement in psychology and mental health called attachment theory, when Bowlby and Ainsworth write about human beings and infants and attachment. And so at the kind of last 50 years or 30 years of mental health awareness, we started to realize that this nature-nurture bond, and I mean, I'm not, it's not fair to say it's a new insight. People have known this forever, that uh, like wisdom traditions have known this, and 
dualists have known this, and uh, but but the bonds that we have as human beings are almost marsupial. We don't like would keep our babies in pouches, but we are tribal and familial as entities. And so you could think of what you are doing here. If you are a patient, you could think of this as this battle between the natural longings that you have as a human being, which want to be fed through your good and wholesome and healthy ties to God, to yourself, to your family, to your community, and this absolutely predatory takeover of your longing apparatus, which the neuroscientists totally would say, I'm saying it in a fair way. And what's at issue is whether we can deconstruct your unhealthy longing and help you make appropriate and healthy longings in a world where we think Facebook is a healthy longing. And Twitter and fake news, and I mean, we, we, we are not doing a good job of providing for people's longing needs as a society anywhere in the United States or around the world. And so it makes it harder to come out of addiction today than, it, than I think maybe even 40 or 50 years ago. So, I think that today's chapel is so deeply important because the theme and the beautiful concurrence of Mother's Day brings in front of us this idea that, and I get to be only with patients, I don't have alumni and families, it's not really that complicated. The question is, are you willing to challenge and seek to break the longing that, you, that has gotten you here? Are you willing to have love crash in and get in the way of you and your heroin, or you and your compulsive sexual behavior, or you and your gambling addiction, or you and your self-injury, or you and your whatever? Because that is longing gone awry. And, and the, the, the reason why chapel has its place at Karen is because Behind chapel, in addition to families getting back together, which is what my dear friend Father Bill used to always say, is behind chapel is this idea of the ultimate longing, which wisdom traditions speak of. The Tao speaks of it as connecting to the way. The Abrahamic traditions speak of it as connecting to the God of Israel. Um, the Hindu traditions speak about, about it in its own way of connecting, but it's actually about ultimate connection. I was saying my prayers this morning, and one of the prayers I say is the Hail Mary prayer from my Catholic origins, and my mother would be so proud that I say that prayer today. But, but because my mom and my uncle had this strong attachment to Mary, mother of Jesus, and, and what I want, in order to finish, and I feel so much better, thank you, by the way, thank you for the water, and thank you for your understanding. Whatever that was just past my little episode, and I'm so glad to be able to sort of want to finish the chapel service and continue to move on. And I'm going to get up in just a second and I'm sure I'm going to be fine. But as you think about coming to the mic and as we move through the readings and prayers, what's in front of us is this idea that we have to repair our longing. We have to find longing that, that is worthy of who you are because you are amazing. And you deserve better longing than what has attached itself to you. It has taken away your dignity and your value as beings. And if that longing is the God of your understanding, awesome. If it is uh, nature and, and uh, Zen Buddhism and whatever, what, 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 find a longing that is not going to pickle your liver and destruct your brain and crush your career and ruin your family. Because that's the longing that got you here, is that's what it's going to do. Jails, institutions, and death is the next step on the train after a year if we cannot redirect your longing. And pray, beg, search, look, and hang out, as Dr. Young said, hang out with people who have been zapped. I'm one of them. And there's a bunch of them here on this place. Jessica's like, woo! <laughs> it is possible. I said to one of our patients 
earlier this week, I so appreciate meeting with this fellow, and he has been in multiple treatments, and he's like starting to despair. And I'm like, do not despair. I have seen people who come here as their 17th treatment who have gotten clean and sober. This can be arrested, and you can become well. So I love you all. It's great to be here.